The bad news is that time flies. The good news, you're the pilot. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 79. And on this episode, I welcome Blaine Elkers. And as America's only chief results officer, he teaches people how to take control of their lives so they can stress less and do more. And what doctoral student couldn't use more productivity secrets? So Blaine, welcome to the show. Heather, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm happy to be here, happy to share today. Hopefully, we're going to help some of the listeners today. We've got some cool frameworks to talk about, but I want to start by thanking you. This is not easy to put together podcasts and record and edit and put this stuff out there, but you're doing a great job. I've listened to some of the episodes myself, have enjoyed it, and I think you have a big what I call results ripple, which means that you're developing content, ideas, shows that are touching lives not yet born. There's somebody who's not even born yet, but 20 years from now, 30 years from now, these podcasts are going to help them and, and, and make a difference. So, so thank you. Kick off the show with a big thank you to you. And, and I look forward to sharing. Today. Oh, well, thank you. Those, uh, what a great way for me to start my day, <laughs> Blaine. <laughs> And I was so excited when we connected because I organize my podcast by topic. And one of the areas where I don't have a lot of shows is related to pre productivity, execution. And we're going to get into this concept that when I read it, I thought, oh, I can't wait to have Blaine teach me how to have a 30 minute hour because boy, could I use that. But before we get into that concept, I was hoping you would just spend a couple minutes introducing yourself to the audience and sharing a little bit of your story. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would lo love to. And, and so I would say, I'll share a couple of the stories. I had a few, uh, what I call moments of dawning comprehension, where kind of, you know, you remember it for the rest of your life. It's this kind of life-changing moment. And, uh, and so for me, there were two of them that kind of led me to where I am today. And the first one was actually in college. I went to Purdue University in Indiana. And I've always been kind of a seeker, a seeker of knowledge. How can I improve myself? And I saw this little ad for an audio tape, audio cassette. I'm probably dating myself, unfortunately, but it was audio cassette for an abridged version of this book called Think and Grow Rich. And so I read this, I got the tape. It was read by this guy, Earl Nightingale, who I ended up liking a lot of his audio programs. But I, I, I listened to that and then I got the book and I read this book in college and in the book, Think and Grow Rich. Now it talks about riches, but not, not just financial. Riches could be good health, good relationships, you know, harmonious relationships with people, whatever the, the, the strong desires of your heart are. And it was kind of a systematic way to kind of take those thoughts and those desires and turn them into a physical reality. So that had a big impact. And later I, I made this little phrase, white Taba, what you think about, you bring about. And, and I did a little TEDx talk about that, but it, it affected me. And I realized that I kind of, through my thoughts and my desires, kind of charted the course of my life. And so in college, I actually met my, my wife. We've been married 30 years. So that's, that was a big, big success. And I, and I had some good success and my degrees in computer science. So that was kind of dawning comprehension moment one. The second one came a little later in life and I was working for a software company and I was on a long business trip and I got back from the trip. And then my son, Bo, he was one year old at the time. He is kind of like giving me the cold shoulder. And I said, Beth, what's going on with Bo here? Why, why is he giving me the cold shoulder? And she's like, well, you were gone so long. He kind of forgot who you were. And I was like, what? Like that hit me like, like emotion that hit me deep. And then I realized when I was a kid, I came home to the empty house. Both my parents worked. My brother wasn't there a lot. So, so it, it really hit me deep. And that night it was a moment of dawning comprehension, which led to a clarifying decision where you kind of make this one decision that, that uh, focuses you so much that, that all the noise of the outside world kind of quiets down. And I made a decision that night. I said, no matter what, I'm going to work from home. I'm going to be the work from home dad. And so it took me a year to get there. We were kind of conservative. We wanted to save up enough money, you know, to make sure everything was going to work, but it took me a year. 
And I started two businesses outside of my regular job. But a year later, I kind of broke free from the job. And, uh, and then I was this work from home dad. And that was now 27 years ago. So for 27 years, I worked from home. And, and what I did is I, I had businesses that I really had no daily operations for. So I had a lot of time to do self-development. And I realized that God put me on the planet to help people take control of their lives by taking control of themselves. And so in 2009, I started a company called Self-Fluence, which uh, is two things. It's the art and science of influencing yourself. But more importantly, it's the, it's the ability, the power you already have to influence yourself. So you don't need a special app. You don't need any to buy anything else. Like you have the power already within inside of, you, you know, to, to do these things that you, that you want to do. So, so anyway, that, that company led to me helping a lot of people, a lot of mastermind groups. They started calling me chief results officer. And I said, Hey, that's a cool title. I'll take it. And then I looked around and nobody else had that. So I went to the patent office and I got the registered trademark. So I have the R with the circle. That, that's why I can say America's only chief results officer. If you want to be a chief results officer and you're listening to this, reach out to me because you have to license the title from me what, because I, I own the, the patent of, of those words or whatever. But anyway, that's what kind of led me, led me here. And, and I'm glad that, that we got connected. And I think uh, maybe it was through LinkedIn or or pod match, but I'm glad we got connected and I'm happy to share today. Well, you said so much there. I'm going to make sure that I have links in the show notes. Your TED talk was amazing. I'm a huge believer of what you think about, you bring about. Yes. I myself have read Think and Grow Rich, and I know you've got some other resources people can check out on your website related to that. But let's talk about this 30 minute hour, because as a chief results officer, I think most people and most students will say to me, Heather, I know I could do this if I just had more time. I'm not getting you the chapters you need. I'm not getting my data analyzed as quickly. I'm not getting you the results you're looking for, I'm looking for, because I don't have enough time. So I'm fascinated about this 30 minute hour. Yes. All right. So let's talk about the 30 minute hour, how to get an hour's worth of stuff done in just 30 minutes. So literally you are compressing time. And the biggest thing that people come to me with, the biggest problem is overwhelm. Too much stuff to do, not enough time to do it. So as we begin to compress time, you're going to find that you're, you're a better person. You handle things better. You know, you're a better friend, a better spouse, you know, a better student, you know, when you begin to find more time by, by compressing time. And so the other great thing is that you already know how to do it. So all the things we teach, we say powered by self-fluence, but everything we teach, you already know how to do. There isn't anything new to learn, but what I'm going to share with you is very powerful. So I want to make sure that it's used for good and not for evil. And so the first question I have for the listeners, I want you to think about this and I'll ask you, Heather, the same question. Let's say that you and I did four 30 minute hours in a row. So we got four hours worth of stuff done in just two hours. So that's gonna leave us two hours of guilt-free time. Now I know the type A person is gonna just put more work in there, but let's say that you, you're not allowed to put work in there and you have two hours of guilt-free time, what would you do with those two hours? So for me, I'm here in my home office. I have a Peloton bike over there, which I really like. So I probably ride my Peloton. I like the outdoors. So I'd probably go out for a hike. I also like to, and I don't do enough of connecting with old friends. I really, really like that. And then since I work from home, I do like the good old fashioned power nap, maybe 15, 20 minutes. So that's, those are the things I would do with two guilt-free hours of non-work. What about you? What would you do? We're really similar. I, the first thing that came to my mind was I would put on my hiking shoes and, but I would take my phone and I would be outdoors talking to all these people that are on my list of, I should call them. I should connect with them. I see a fake Facebook post or an Instagram and I'm like, oh, I want to talk, but there's just not time for that. So the connecting, the being outdoors, the exercising, I don't know if this counts as work. I would love to go through my photos on my phone. And actually, remember the old school? We used to take pictures with a camera you turned in to the drugstore. I mean, I'm dating myself too. Or, you know, the little film canister. 
And so we had pictures and albums and my kids, as you know, just turned 18 and graduated. And I'm thinking, I'd like to put together a little photo album for them. I don't have the physical pictures. So I don't know if that counts as work. I think it would be fun and enjoyable. And right now it's not even on my list of things to do. So. No, that, that definitely counts. That definitely counts. And I hope the listeners are thinking of what are some of those things? Because the goal here is as you compress time, put some of those things back in, because those are the things that typically life is made up of. So I, I also have talked with, interviewed a lot of people at the end of life, and they never say, I wish I worked more. They always say, I wish I had more memorable moments with the people I love. So anything around those memorable moments w w would be great. I have thousands and thousands of pictures in my phone, which I should, you know, I need to go through just like you. W one of the fun things I started as our kids left the nest is I do this flashback Fridays. So every Friday on a little text chain of the whole family, I post some weird picture of the four of us, you know, back in, back in the day, you know, and sometimes they try to guess where it is and stuff like that. Anyway, a little tip there, flashback Fridays, I call that. All right. So let's get into this, the 30 minute hour. So like I said before, you've already, you know how to do this. You know how to be productive. And there's a day, there's a day of the year. Some people have it more than once a year, but there's this day where people are three to 10 times more productive than an average day. Now that's 3X to 10X. We're only looking for 2X. We're just going from 60 down to 30. So we're looking for 2X, but this is 3X to 10X, three to 10 times more productive than their average day. Do you know what day it is? What day of the year? Are we, is? Oh, a day of the year? Well, well, oh, it, January it, it could happen a few, it could January. happen a few, it could happen a few times during the year. So it's not like a specific date. Oh, okay. Um, a holiday, a three day weekend. No, but three-day weekends are good and fun, but that's that's not this specific day where you're three to 10 times more productive than your average day. Mondays. Not Mondays. Okay. So you're like, <laughs> like, like look, I'm, I didn't think I'm this was going to be a out. quiz. I'm, I'm, I, I'm I didn't think I was going to this question. I'm failing this quiz. You didn't think it was going to be a quiz today. And for students' sake, I should not have made it a quiz. All right. So let me just give you the answer because now this is what I, when you think of, the 30 minute hour, I want you to think of this day and it's the day before vacation. So the day before vacation, people are three to 10 times more productive than they are on a normal day. And so what I, what I did is I come up with a, a little acronym to try to unpack the power of the day before vacation and use it to create these 30 minute hours. And so the acronym is PDF. Now I use that PDF because that's like, something people remember, hey, email me the PDF or print out the PDF. And so it's something to, to remember. Now, I won't quiz you on what that really means in the tech world. It stands for portable document format. Basically, it's something you can print from any computer, but everyone knows PDF. So think the 30-minute hour, day before vacation, PDF. And PDF stands for plan, delegate, focus, right? So I'm going to unpack each one of those. So plan, delegate, focus. So now when you think about the day before vacation, people plan that day out a lot more than they plan their average day. So the first trick here, the first hack to having a 30 minute hour is simply planning your day better, right? So planning your day better, and maybe even like the day before vacation, planning a few more things in your day. The day before day vacation is a little packed, right? It's got a lot, a lot of stuff going on in there, but that, that I call it next day planning. I never like to let a day end without planning the next one, but pre-planning the day ahead is going to give you, you're going to do more stuff. You're going to get more stuff done. And when you have more stuff to do, like the day before vacation, you start to say, well, I'm only going to have so, this much time. You know, and you start to put, you know, kind of guardrails on, on things and that, that works well. The other thing is the day before vacation, people wake up 30 to 60 minutes earlier that day. So again, if you want a 30 minute hour right away, you can wake up 30 minutes earlier than you, than you normally do and, and get that in. And some people do that a couple of times a week, right? They say, well, let's, let me add in that, that 30 minutes. So they get up early. The other thing about planning is that the day before vacation, you have a pretty clear vision on what you have to get done. So, th so there again, just spending a few minutes and getting real clear, what's the, what do I need to get done? And on the day before vacation, people tend to use the 80-20 rule a lot more. So Heather, have you heard of that before, the 80-20 rule? Yes, I love the 80-20 rule. Okay, so most people 
when I ask them, I, I say, do you know that? Say yes. I say, do you believe me? And they say, I do for the most part. Maybe it's not always exactly 80-20, but the 80-20 rule says 20% of what you do produces 80% of your results and 80% of what you do produces only 20% of your results. So what happens on the day before vacation, you tend to focus on the 20 that makes the results. And you also tend to oust the 80 that does it, right? So, so again, you can gain some more time by, by, and kind of what's easier out of those two is ousting the 80 actually. So like taking stuff out of your schedule, you know, you know, long times in social media or, you know, shiny, chasing shiny objects, you know, those things, you know, typically are not part of the 20, they're part of the 80. So sometimes it's easier to begin to reduce things and take things out of your day to make room for some higher value, more productive things. But, but looking to do that, looking to use the 80, 20 rule when, when you're, when you're doing the planning. So that's the P the second part is D for delegate. So on the day before vacation, you delegate typically almost as much as 10 times more than a normal day because you, you, you know you can't do it all. And you actually, there's part of your brain that thinks who before the do. So I always say think who before the do, meaning you think who else could do this before you go do it. And so you really think about who can you delegate to? For example, my wife also works from home, but she'll go out to run errands and she'll be like, oh, can I run any errands for you? Whoa, whoa, 30 minute hour immediately, right? If she'll go to the post office and drop the stuff off and go to the bank and do all these errands for me, you know, that just created a 30 minute hour for me right away. Also looking for things that you might not like to do that are lower value and delegate those out just like you do the day before vacation. That could be housework, that could be, you know, lawn care or landscaping, that could even be meal prep. I mean, there's a lot of different things that, that, uh, that, that people kind of delegate out or, or defer out. So look to, to be a better delegator that can instantly create some 30 minute hour. And the most powerful one is the last one, which is focus. So it's plan, delegate, focus. Now focus, this is kind of weird, is that on the day before vacation, you have this fierce focus. And, and it's so powerful. It's so powerful that I have a little card here by my desk that says day before vacation mode. Like I want to remember that every, every time to have that focus. Because if you think about the day before vacation, there's a lot of stuff that you don't do. You don't chit chat. You don't chase shiny objects. You don't have long internet time. You're not binge watching Netflix. You're not stuck in any long conversations. You're really kind of keeping it going, going, going and, and keeping it tight. And you use the most powerful word in the, in the results English language. And that's the word no. So the day before vacation, people say, Blank, can you do this? Blank, can you do that? No, 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 no. I'm like, Dr. No, I'm a master at no that day and bring that in to your regular day. And the no, not only does it help create more time, but the big thing is it avoids the 90 minute hour. And the 90 minute hours when someone asks you for an hour's worth of help and you know, and you end up spending 90 minutes, or could you just read this thing over and do this for me? And instead of 30 minutes, it's 60 minutes, right? So it, it takes longer than you think. So no is really important to use. The other thing on the day, the focus that you have on the day before vacation you tend to stay on schedule and you tend to use timers more. So I use a lot of timers during my day. Say, okay, I'm going to work on this research for 30 minutes. I'll tell Siri to set a timer for 30 minutes. And I use timers and I stay on schedule. I tend to time block the day. I, I tend to, you know, you know, only have certain blocks where I've got to move on to the next thing. So I've got to finish that. So you can literally kind of compress things by using your schedule and then also using, using timers. And even like when people ask for my time, they'll say, hey, could we meet for an hour to brainstorm this project? And I'll say, could we do it in 30 minutes? Most of the time they say yes. Now I just created a 30 minute hour, but also they cherish my time a lot more. Like they know, okay, well, he said 30 minutes, like let's get, to, let's stay on task. And again, I don't want to bring the stress of the day before vacation. And so some people only use this, these techniques every other day, you know, because they don't want it to be boom, 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 like craziness. Right. But, but they, they're very effective in, in, you know, in, in their use. So, so timers are big. The last part of the fierce focus is that on the day before vacation, people become masters at tasking. So, so they become all of a sudden out of the blue, they become this task master and there's three types of tasking. There's single tasking, 
multitasking and batch tasking. So single tasking, that is when it's a job only you can do. Like, you know, I've got to spend, you know, an hour, you know, or, or two hours or three hours doing this research and it's got to be me, right? So when it's just you, the key to the single, the, the, the way to, have, to get an hour's worth of single tasking stuff in 30 minutes is complete destruction of distraction. And when you destroy all the distractions, you will be able to do that. Like I can get an hour's worth of article writing in 30 minutes if I will go into airplane mode on my phone, shut my door, you know, to my office, turn off all the rings, dings, and bangs, you know, only have that one screen up that I'm working on and have a piece, have multiple pieces of scrap paper. So when the monkey mind kicks in and say, wait, you, you said you were going to do this to this and that, and that blah, 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 blah. I just write that stuff down and I keep moving, right? So I, I, I acknowledge it and I capture it, but I get right back to what I'm doing. When I have that single tasted focus, that's probably how I produce the most 30 minute hours in my own day personally, is that, you know, really single tasking, really single focused on, on whatever the th only things I can do. The second one, multitasking, sometimes gets a bad rap, but it's when you can do two things at the same time without compromising the quality of either one. So I, I can't be on this podcast and do my email at the same time. That's the bad use of, of, of that's not real multitasking. But when I, when I can do something like, I love your podcast, but I also want to exercise, right? So if instead of, you know, if I could do the podcast and listen to uh, listen to the podcast and do my exercise th at the same time. Well, now, you know, I, I could do 30 minutes of both of those things. So I got an hour's worth of stuff done in, in 30 minutes. Or another example is, you know, you, you know, I, I, it's a day before vacation. I have a 30 minute drive someplace. Well, normally I might throw on some eighties rock music or something and, and rock out. But now I'm saying, wait, day before vacation, I got to get stuff done. I know I can make two phone calls. So, you know, I got the hands-free phone. It's safe. I can do driving and talking on the phone, you know, of equal high quality at the same time. So you're looking for ways to get that synergy to do two things at the same time. A lot of times you're doing chores where you're busy with your hands. You could be feeding your mind at the same time. Or I used to love exercise, but I love family time. So we all learned how to play tennis. Now we can kind of do those things together. So you're looking for that, that thing. So single tasking, multitasking. The last one is batch tasking. And that is just where you batch things that go together, together, like running errands. Day before vacation, you're not going to, you have three errands, run an errand, come back, run an errand, come back. No, you're going to go out one time, do all three errands and come back. And so this batching works for errands, but it also works for computer work. It works for phone calls, like batch those things that have a likeness or a sameness to their context together. And then you can get an hour's worth of that stuff done in 30 minutes, especially if you use some timers as well. And the batching also works with employees, uh, teammates, uh, spouses. Uh, you know, what I mean by that is my wife works from home, like I said. So we can interrupt each other all day long with text messages and things, but instead we have a shared note inside our iPhones and we add the stuff there so that when we get together, usually for lunch, when we sit at lunch, now we open up that list when we have the context of us being together and then we go through that stuff. Same thing with like office hours, right? I mean, you could have students or friends or people, you know, staff interrupting you, but if you say, look, I'm going to do single tasking from nine to 11, let's meet at 11 for 30 minutes and we'll handle all the questions. And then maybe again at the end of the day. So batching together those interruptions, any way that you can, will give you some, some 30 minute hours. So, so there it's planning, it's delegating, it's fierce focus. And the overriding thing that happens on the day before vacation is that you release your inner perfectionist. So you release your inner perfectionist and done is better than perfect. You've got to get it done. You're going on vacation. And when you let things either hand them off to other people, you know, it's not going to be as good as you can do it, but you release that perfectionist and you say like, I've just got to get it done. And so bring some of that back in, you'll get more done. And you know what? Sometimes that last 10% isn't worth all the effort, you know, to, to get something perfect. Now, sometimes something, you know, you're working on a, a paper, something has to get right for sure. But a lot of times Think day before vacation, release that inner perfectionist, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll be having 30-minute hours all the time. Wow, Blaine. <laughs> Where do I start? I can, I've been taking notes, 
And I can just tell this is going to be one of those episodes where people will keep coming back and picking up a tip and trying it out. So I want to start by saying you helped me understand why I've been so productive this week. Just last night, I was telling my daughter, come over for movie night. I had told her, no, we usually do movie night on Friday. I, my list is too long this week. I'm going to have to be Dr. No. And I called her last night and I said, I don't know why I got so much done this week, but it's because we're going on vacation. There you go. Nice. And you're right. I have, I've written out in a meticulous way, blocking time and batching. Now I live in a place where I have to go to my PO box to pick up my mail. So it's become very interesting where I, I'm like, okay, I'm getting ready to go on vacation. What are the, all the things I need to pick up that I can do when I go pick up my mail on Wednesday? And so thank you for helping me discover, uncover, figure out why I've been so productive this week. So let's unpack some of these things. I have so many notes here. In terms of planning, it sounds so simple, but I know when I don't plan the day before, I wake up almost immediately feeling stressed out. <gasps> the day is starting. I know my list is long. Where am, where am I going to get it done? And so this idea of just taking a few moments the day before, do you usually recommend people do that? As a, as a habit after dinner, they sit down, get out their calendar and actually look at the day ahead. Yeah, I think so. You know, personally, you have to figure out what's the best time for you. Some people, you know, will do it at night and uh, there's a concept, I talk about habits, but there's a concept, uh, one, ha one concept is habit link, where you link to something you're already a habit master at. And, and so some people do it like they link it to, if I'm brushing my teeth, at night and I haven't done my list for the day, I'm going to do it then. So they leave a pad of paper with the toothbrush. So that's one. But now some people get too excited. Now this is me. I get too excited for the next day. I can't do it at night right before bed. I do it earlier in the day. You know, so like you said, some people could link it to when I'm doing dinner or right after dinner, you know, I'm going to plan out the day. And I would say win early and win often. And what I mean by that is just do it. Even if you just write down a list of Here's the top thing I have to do tomorrow. Just the one thing, right? Now you could you can map it out. There's different levels. I call it daily day design, where you design the day. There's different levels, but level one is just, hey, just a little list of the top things you know you have to do tomorrow. Just having that is a big advantage psychologically, like you said, when you wake up. Because I often tell people, it's like you're at the airport and you're going down you know, the, 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 the jetway and you're getting on the airplane and you look over at the cockpit and there's no pilot in there. You thought, well, maybe they're just in the restroom, whatever. And you sit down and the flight attendant comes by and you say, hey, I, I didn't see the pilot. You know, where's the pilot? And she says, well, there is no pilot today. So you're on the, there is no pilot. And so, so what are you going to do? There's no pilot. And you see, is the pilot coming and say, no, the pilot's not coming. And then the flight attendant says, I might try to fly it, right? I mean, you're, you're out of there, right? You're out of there. You're, you're never going to go anywhere. And that's what you're doing when you wake up in the morning and you don't have any kind of a plan, you're sitting on the plane with no pilot. Now, occasionally someone else will start the plane up and drive and you'll be captured onto somebody else's list, but you really want to make that, you really want to make that list for the next day. And then you can get fancy, right? There's higher levels of design of your day. Of, here's the things I got to get done. Here's the time blocks, right? Some people, you know, break their, their day down into chunks. Some people have morning routines, some people have evening routines. I mean, you can really kind of, you know, deck out your, your daily day design. I have a, a, an extensive one that I typically actually do in the afternoon. So uh, I like to be done. I like to get my top three done by three. I say three by three, but I like to be done with my list, you know, early in the day. So then I'm working on tomorrow's list, which is more energizing for me. And I, I do talk about this thing, this idea about being a day ahead. I, I run better by being a day ahead and working on tomorrow's stuff than I am working on kind of today's stuff, which feels a little heavier. Well, and I have to say, I have seen a huge difference with doctoral students who actually sit down and write when they're going to do their studies versus letting it kind of happen. <laughs> like you say, the plane takes off and next thing you know, you're working on someone else's stuff. So right. to take a moment, think as you're listening, how could I integrate some of these tips around planning specifically about my degree completion? And then we move on to delegate. Delegate. I love this. 
who before the do? I'm going to start doing that, that this week, Blaine. Okay, is there someone else who could do this? And I did notice the week before vacation, I'm actually having more than just one day of productivity, but I've been telling my daughters, I need you to do this because there won't be enough time for me to do it before we leave. And so becoming this master delegator is so important when you're when you're in a doctoral program where you've maybe already got a career, you've got a family, you've got other things going on and you're trying to fit this in, delegation can be the name of the game. So I love that who before the do. Yes, yeah, so, so true. And, and here's, what, here's what's different about the day before vacation is that you ask for help. See, most people, they don't want to ask for help. But now when the, the day before vacation, you have to ask for help because you're going away and it's not going to get done. So try to bring some of that back in you know, and a lot of people, oh, I don't want to ask for help. But, but you know what? When you ask for help, you have to realize that that gives that other person an opportunity to help you, which they may or may not want to do. But it bonds that relationship. It, it, it takes that relationship further. So don't be afraid to ask for help. And I, I was really bad about that early on. But as I let other people help me, you know, and some people I pay them to, to do the work, you know, but, but letting other people do it and asking for help is, is a big one that, that people do more of that the day before vacation and not in their normal life. So we're trying to bring some of that back into your normal life as well. So don't be afraid to ask, ask for help for sure. And I think that is a trait for people that are going on to continue their education. They're used to being very competent to doing things on their own, to not asking for help. So this getting into this habit of, can I ask someone for help, whether that's with meal prep or chores or maybe even faculty as you're trying to develop something with your research is something that can really be the difference between feeling overwhelmed and feeling like you're in control of your day and you're getting things done. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes. So let's talk about uh, and hey, uh, related to that, becoming Dr. No. Yes. I think everyone should put that on a sticky note if you're in a doctoral program. There are times where you might not want to say no, but you need to say no. Yes. You know, and, and I often tell people, you know, when you say no, you're, you're saying no for the bigger yes, right? So, so you're going to have to say no to a lot of things to be that person that does make it through the doctoral program, all right? And, and so I also say, once you know, you can know. And, and so once you know K-N-O-W and, you know, the, the word no, K-N-O-W, then you can know N-O. And if you look at the word no, K-N-O-W, it has the word no right in the middle of it. So, so once you know better, you can know better, N-O, better. <laughs> so I, I think if you think about that and realize every time you say yes, you know, a little piece of your dream might be going away with that. So make sure it's in alignment with who you are, where you're going. And I'm not saying be rude. And there's, you, you can come up with ways to, to say no gracefully, you know. And the other thing about no is just make it not your default. Make, make sure yes is not your default. That's the big thing. And just give yourself a little gap, you know. So like the, the one gap out that you can use every time is I, I, re I really need to check my schedule. I have a lot going on. You know, I, I need to check my schedule. If you're married, you can say, I need to check with my spouse, you know, but, but just, just try to create a little gap to the yes as, as best you can. So, and, and you, you kind of build up to the point where you can say no, but the day before vacation, you, you, you're able to say no. So, so maybe keep that frame of mind, you know, with you. And, and that's good. That is one of the biggest ways that you can take control of your life and go from that overwhelm and, and behind state into the caught up state. And this know before you know, it makes so much sense and can help you be gracious, I would think, when you're saying no, because if you know your priority is finishing your program, you could say, thank you for the opportunity or thank you for thinking of me or asking me, but right now my priority is this and I've made a commitment to myself to not take on any extra projects right now try me again later or, or whatnot, right? So you, like right. you said, you can be very gracious about it, but when you know your priority is your program, maybe you can say no with a little less guilt. I, I think so. And that's the big thing is to keep your, you know, keep the, the thing that you're bringing about in your life, keep that front and center, right? And so, you know, there, there's lots of ways to do that. I, I like using your unlock screen on your phone to remind you, but, but think about ways to keep what, what's important to you 
in front of you, right? And, and, and it could be your doctor program, it could be your family, you know, it could be some big business project you're working on, but whatever it is, yeah, keep that front and center. And I know we've already been talking for a while here, but I just want to make some comments on this multitasking. You gave example of, you know, you want to exercise, you know, you want to move. So you all learned tennis and going through a doctoral program, you will not go through it alone. You're going to bring your friends, your family, your coworkers. So maybe just taking a moment as you're listening to this podcast and think, think to yourself, what's on my list? that maybe I could do that could be fun, that would include someone else who may not be seeing me as much anymore because I'm so focused on my program. So it's important. You don't want to come to the end of your program and be all alone. <laughs> and relationships right. do require some maintenance. So get creative about how you may be able to get some of those things on your list done while you're including others. And then you talk about one, just, yeah, just yeah. one thing on that is I think it's so important, you know, and, and I know some listeners to your podcast are probably the people that are supporting those doctoral students. And I think it's important to know what they're going through. So my wife just finished nursing school. My daughter just became a medical doctor, but it's is to know what they're going through and be supportive. But then just like Heather said, look for the synergies. And what I mean by that is, you know, like I knew, say my daughter likes to hike. And so if it was like, look, do you want to blow off some steam? We'll do a 30 minute hike, short hike, get some good exercise in and I'll bring lunch. I mean, you got to eat, right? So, so lo looking for that synergy where she could get, you know, stress relief, a meal, you know, and a hike all in, you know, in one shot, you know, something like that, that, that is really, you know, helpful for them. But again, if you're that student, yes, think about what are things that you can do? Can you exercise with a friend or, or things that where you can get get the, that multitasking, you kind of, kind of, you know, doing two things at the same time. And I had an episode on with a couple that had gone through doctoral programs at different times. And they said they got, maybe, maybe it seems a little silly, but they decided to make grocery shopping their date night. So they were getting something crossed off their list, but then they would go out, they would go out to dinner first and then go grocery shopping. So they were getting a chore done, but it, they always knew Friday night was coming. So get creative, you guys. Think about ways, because you mentioned earlier when we first started this show, no one ever says at the end of their life, wow, I wish I had worked more. Your degree is always going to be there, right? So I'm always encouraging people, don't lose sight of these other things that are just if, as important, if not more important than that degree that you're striving after. Releasing perfection. You said something like done is better than perfect. I wish every doctoral student would write that on their mirror. Done is better than perfect. So you had so many tips, tricks, fun little word phrases here, Blaine. Such a pleasure to have you on the show. Before we wrap up, and I'm going to ask you to come back because before we were recording, you were talking about your 21 second habits. And if you're yes. game, I'd love to have you back because I know my audience would dig that as well. But as we're getting ready to wrap up here, any final words of wisdom or a quote or something you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. I would love to come back and talk about the 21 second habits, how to create new habits in 21 seconds instead of 21 days. So that, that's, that, that's really, really fantastic. And, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave with, with this quote, the bad news, the bad news is that time flies. The good news, you're the pilot, you're the pilot. So take control, make it a good day and, and really pilot your day every day. Blaine, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom with the listeners. I'm going to be sure to have in the show notes, all the ways that people can contact you because you've got some great stuff out there, especially your TEDx talk. So again, thank you. And I look forward to having you back again soon. All right, thank you. If you love listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, would you mind supporting me? The best way you can do this is by sharing your favorite episodes with a friend or two, or heck, maybe three. All episodes are available on most podcast directories, my YouTube channel, and my website. To make it easy, I'll pop these links in the show notes below. Oh, hey, one more thing. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only. 